everyone. Let's get dangerous. <laughs> this is so cool. I know. It feels so right. It's Jake Fury. He's opening our minds to new ideas. Kill him. Who is that guy? Your mama. You just made the list. <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. It's all in fantasy. Things of the rain. Sure, we talk about it all the time. Really? No. Burn. Woo, you ducks, it is all in fantasy, Tales of the Ranks, with Jake Seeley and Chris Meany as we get you ready for the fantasy football season is a week and three days away. We're actually almost here. This is the final draft week. Well, I guess if you try to get the last minute ones in on next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or also, depending on when you're listening to this, I mean, you might be having your draft that week and you're just catching up now. As a reminder, if you are just catching up right now, you're almost out of time because next week we'll be announcing the winners for the FTN and potential Madden giveaway. We got so close, meaning we're at 11. Just one more spot. One more spot. I might do it anyway, but one more spot to get inside <laughs> the top 10 to give away Madden. So make sure, as a reminder, if you haven't yet, because yes, we were trying to get all of the listeners back who are still like, where did your podcast go? It is here. But if you're listening, you've already heard it. So you have to do this so other people can find it, which is yes. rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, of course, everywhere else, Spotify, if you want. But those are the big ones on Apple. Those are to get you the entries. Take the screenshots, send them to me, Jay Seeley at The Athletic, and tweet about it. I'll retweet. If you tag us, I'll retweet your tweet so people can see and hopefully find the new podcast, which is here with a brand new spanking logo, which also I don't... You can see, oh, wait, I can't point behind me. If you're looking on YouTube, um, there's the new Hyrule poster as I point everywhere. There's one over there that I got of AFC Richmond. Ted Lasso season four is happening, Chris Meany. Is that, that's probably <laughs> better than anything fantasy football that I saw this week. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, fantastic show. Fantastic setup there. Uh, we do appreciate the support. And just nice to that the next football game that we break down is is actually going to be a real one. Football. Yeah, we I know. Play. Yeah. There, there is a little bit Rings that and uh, I, th I think we need to talk about from week three of the preseason, whatever you might want to call it, and some more draft strategy today as we finalize things, as we get you ready. There's a mm, big question mark one. I say big one because it could be, but question mark of whether you believe it is. So I tweeted this out during the Titans game, and I was like, ooh, maybe I need to adjust the Tony Pollard share with Tajay Spears. And I did. I didn't go crazy. I actually gave him not even a full 5%, but I think it was like 4% and change. I was playing with some of the numbers. I actually ticked down Hassan Haskins in a little bit more. It doesn't even, might, might even be the third option, honestly, at this point. But that's irrelevant because we all assumed it was going to be 50-50. More of a lean for Pollard in the run game. More of a lean for Spears in the passing game. But Pollard, all first team. Spears is out there too, but Spears played later in the game. Of course, it's preseason. This could be... They just wanted to see a little bit more of Spears before the season started, wanted to get him a few more touches, a few more reps, whatever it might be. But throughout the preseason, it has been Pollard. It has been Pollard near the goal line, which was the question mark that we had coming from the Cowboys. I say we give Pollard a little bit more to give you an idea of what that actually is equates to uh, i do have the projections up right now so you can go play with them as a reminder over at the athletic you could be like nope i think you're still dumb jake uh 48 is way too much for tony pollard but i have 48.6 percent rushing 38.4 percent for spears 7.5 target share but 10.5 for spears but that's a 10 percent gap in the rushing and only a three percent in the passing game do you agree with me with me meanie yeah, I do. Um, okay. I, I feel like, yeah, the, I, I don't want to say the preseason super telling, but you, you talked about the first team. And then when there was a situation where they went for it on fourth down over the weekend and, and they took out Spears and put Pollard back in, it was like a fourth and short uh, situation. So he's the veteran, right? I mean, Brian Callahan is, is, he, Brian Callahan has told us, like, we're going to use both of these guys. You know, 50-50, ride the hot hand. Who knows? Third down, goal line, they can both do it all. So, um, yeah, I, I would say just with the contract that they gave him as the veteran who's been in the NFL for a couple of years, who has handled a full workload, whether he wasn't super efficient with it last year, before the previous year with Zeke, Zeke's final right. year in Dallas, he was. Uh, so I would just say, like, even if I didn't see them touch the field at all in any of the preseason action, I would say it's like a 60-40 type split 
uh, but which could is more turn pronounced than what people assumed. Absolutely. I have Pollard at RB26. I think I have Spears at RB31. Um, I've seen Spears go ahead of him. They basically go side by side in drafts. Once one Titan back comes off the board, the other one is like coming off pretty quickly. I think I took Pollard in your league uh, in New York and Flex League. And I think like three picks after that was was Tajay Spears. Um, and I was debating between the two, and I just thought I would lean with the veteran and, and the guy that they paid and who I expect to get a little bit more this year. So I, I do agree with what you did over there with, with terms of projections. But you and I will be talking – throughout the season, we're going to be talking about, hey, man, Spears looked better. Is it now Spears? And we'll say, maybe. Uh, but mm-hmm. Pollard isn't going. Mark. You know what I mean? Like, it is going to be frustrating. But I actually think both of these guys could be, like, decent flex plays. I think Pollard has a, a better chance of being a low in RB2 for you. So then, as of today, would you take Tony Pollard or would you take Nick Chubb or Jonathan Brooks, the injured players? Because uh, we do have news as we enter this podcast today is that Nick Chubb is not officially, but it, for, the report made it sound like it's officially going to happen. He's starting the year on the putt, which means he misses the first four games, which means not only do you get not Nick Chubb until October, my whole point of taking Nick Chubb as an RB3 inside those low 20s was that 100% Nick Chubb by October. Well, if he's missing the first four games, the problem needs and now another game or two before you get 100% Nick Chubb. Similar to saw yeah. what Jonathan Taylor did, as if we remember last year, Jonathan Taylor, when he came back, even with how junky the running backs were playing, that was before like Zach Moss was like even doing a whole lot of Zach Moss things. He looked good at times, but like this was Jonathan Taylor. Those first two games was like, eh, five to 10 carries, then 10, 12 carries, and then... So if it's Nick Chubb six weeks before 100%, I feel like we're taking Tony Pollard. I feel like even yeah. maybe question mark Taze Spears, but would you take Tony Pollard over Jonathan Brooks? Because that's the bigger one. Like Jonathan Brooks has the big injury concern. They already said he's going to start off injured, but is it the same as Nick Chubb? Like that one's kind of still hanging out there. Like if you're drafting today, obviously we might get some news by we do the second podcast this week. But as of today, are you taking Tony Pollard or Nick Chubb or Jonathan Brooks? Mm-hmm. I'm taking Pollard over both. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I probably won't have, I don't have a lot of shares of Brooks and I probably won't with my home leagues coming up and a couple more drafts uh, that I'm going to do like squeezing until like two days before the season starts. I, I don't feel like I'll have a lot of Brooks. I think he's, I think he's the best back in the class. I think he's, he's the guy that has the, I think it's like bell cow ability for sure. Like if I'm ranking all the guys, I would say <laughs> like, like Brooks. Bell cow ability. I like that word. It's, <laughs> Right. <laughs> the other guys, I just don't feel like do. I mean, Benson, sure. But I don't think Connor's going anywhere. I don't think you I think you agree that Connor is, is the guy there, at least for one more year, final year of his deal. Uh, I mean, I but, have James Connor inside my top 20. If I knew James Connor was playing 16 games, I'd have him as an RB1. I have him at like 16 or 17. Yeah, I have him aggressively ranked two ahead of most guys. Uh, I think we're we've just been in on Connor over the past couple of years and we expect him to miss James a Connor or Aaron he's Jones. always done. I, I have Connor ahead of Aaron Jones. Yeah, Really? Yeah, I'm pretty low on Jones. I have him like RB20. Really? I know we're we're like pretty much on the same page of a lot of with a lot of players, but you and I I saw your ranks. You have like high high in RB2. That's 16. Low in. Yeah. I have a sandwich Um, between James Cook and Rashad White. I would take Aaron Jones before Rashad White. That's how concerned I am about Bucky Irving. Yeah, and I think you have a right to be, right? He's been impressive in in the preseason yards after contact, catching balls out of the backfield. Um new regime that's the thing like it, it's easy people just say like oh well he's gonna get that work that rashad white had and, you know dave canals is gonna give up to him I, I just don't think so i think like next year and yeah. there's a time where oh, maybe i don't, yeah, I don't think in the Bucky second half, in the backfield yeah yeah like there's there's no reason to to rush this guy they're gonna be worst team in, uh, on fo- in football probably one of the worst offenses you're gonna they're already talking about at least october so Man, when he comes in, you get a little bit of Chuba. Miles is an afterthought, but I don't, I don't see him. No, long-winded answer. I don't. I'm not really <laughs> interested. Uh, give me Pollard. Give me the guy who's healthy and in a fun offense. Okay, then let's go back to the Buccaneers of Bucky Irving, and that's not who I want to talk about. Exactly, Jalen McMillan. Uh, so, hmm. if anybody doesn't know and didn't see, so I recap. As a heads up, in case you haven't paid attention for years. I do the rookies before the draft, and then I do the rookies after the draft. I do tiers because there's a lot of differences in like where players land, as we're seeing just this year alone. Big three included Roma Dunze. After the draft, 
not in the same tier as Marvin Harris and Malik Neighbors because this year might be a little bit of a slow start. But we had that conversation about moving Roma Dunze up from where we initially had him last week, if you missed that podcast. But that's not what I'm talking about. Jalen McMillan, during the draft process, I said, got overlooked. And I think part of it was because of the offense, the two wide receivers in front of them that were played. But part of the reason they played is it was McMillan before them. McMillan was hurt, missed a lot of time. When he came back, and especially when I was watching the championship game, I really like, and I said the same thing about McMillan, he knows how to find space. Like he just works that middle of the field. Uh, I compared it a little bit to like Tyra Lockett with Russell Wilson in the fact of that he knows where to be when things are breaking apart or where to find the space where the quarterback's going to look. And part of this might be a fascination of mine with McMillan, the fact that I do like McMillan, I feel like he got overlooked, but he's been making a little bit of noise here. Now, of course, no Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, you know, limited use so far. So the Buccaneers aren't going to go full bore with Evans and Godwin. And I'm not saying that McMillan's unseating either one of them, but I do think he's made enough noise to supplant Trey Palmer as the three. And if something were to happen to Mike Evans at this point of his age and or Godwin's been banged up for years now, is that McMillan is like a late round flyer that I don't think enough people are taking a chance on. No, I would agree. And I, I think, um, was he a day two pick? I think he was. Um, and that's like pretty noticeable for me. It's not like they drafted him to be, you know, just like the fifth or sixth wide receiver on the team. I think they drafted he was him. 90 second. It's third round. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't want to cut in. Third, so round. third round. But I, 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 was, um, I was trying to remember if he was top 100. Yeah, so he's anyway, top hundred. Okay. I think McCaffrey is like one hundred. I was I was looking at it again last week. Just um, talking about McCaffrey yeah, I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think they drafted him to be like some sort of you know uh, again like fourth or fifth wide receiver on the team. I think they drafted him because they weren't super impressed with Trey Palmer, and Palmer's been hurt. And I agree with your take. I think also they drafted him to potentially be like the successor of Chris Godwin. Like if Chris Godwin's a guy that they move on from, you know they can they vision him in the in the slot but godwin's been playing in the slot they're talking about put him in the slot so i think he's got a role as the number three wide receiver kate otten does run a lot of routes i was looking at some of our stats too i was just getting uh, that's this is what my friday night was i was on ftmfantasy.com <laughs> and i was looking at all these just random statistics and this is like what is it some of it means nothing some of it's awesome like what do we have because stats hub is just intense and i was seeing route particip- route run participation and like yeah. kate otten was like number one in the nfl i'm like really like this guy is just out there running like a route every time that's awesome like can he get more involved no because it's it's what (laughs) who came up with the term it's not the exercise routes uh but it's the oh it's like the fitbit stuff it's just yeah like running around routes the fittest routes or whether because you're just running and you're not actually doing anything yeah it's like i think it's a term that's used a lot in in the nba it's like wow this guy had 36 minutes and he took two shots and he didn't touch the ball (laughs) he's just out there like he's getting his steps in at least he's getting them in uh so i just like wonder can there actually be because rashad white's probably the three right can there be somebody else in this offense to step up and maybe it's just because of the lack of talent that they had so maybe mcmillan is a guy uh but he's he's been very noticeable you're right jake so i think he's definitely had a trey palmer and like a stash like a late like you said, maybe Evans older, Godwin, or maybe they figure I out a way have, to get three three wide receivers involved. For the projections, I do have McMillan and Kate Otten both with twelve plus percentage of the target shares, which puts them both in the seventy to seventy five target range. It's but decent. it is, but I mean, if for Otten it equates to forty eight, four eighty, and four. A lot of fours in there. Uh, for McMillan, it's mm, I, I got to move because it's right there. This the camera's in the way. Forty six, five seventy three, and three and a half. But a little bit higher ceiling for sure. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Is like the reason I want McMillan and not Kate Otten is because mm-hmm. even if one of those two gets hurt, I, that's the thing. I think McMillan steps in, right. and you can see that target share getting up to twenty percent. I think Kate Otten is Kate Otten. I know you have a soft spot for Kate Otten, and I'm not coming for like, oh, you're stupid. No, 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 no. I, I just, would just wondered like, I just don't um, think this is what yeah. Baker does. Is tar- target is tight, at least with the Buccaneers. It just doesn't feel like he's looking. No, for Kate. it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And I just want that's what I, my whole thinking was is like, is there room for like somebody else to kind of eat in this offense and and just maybe moving Godwin to the slot back into the slot does it, it certainly does open up an opportunity. Well, that's what's interesting too, is receiver. that I think McMillan's gonna be playing outside when they're in three wide and then he yeah. comes off the field for two. 
So yeah. you're going to get more movement for Godwin, but you're getting McMillan out there as a starter. Okay, so right. yeah. another rookie way high up our draft boards, at least, and somebody I'm excited to get in the ninth round. I might even take a flyer in the eighth, but sometimes he goes in the 10th. It was Brian Thomas, as everybody knows at this point, for the Jaguars. Love his skill set. I don't know how many times I've said it on the show and in general. There's a concerning factor, though. I will say that. So if you talk about the route run participation with the first team, with the Trevor Lawrence, it's been very high for Brian Thomas. I think it was like 92% or something like that. But somebody was 100, and it was Gabe Davis. Does that concern you at all for our Brian Thomas love? For me, it doesn't. I, I, I actually feel like that 100% might not equate to 100% once the season starts. Maybe I'm wrong. And maybe at some point... It changes. If I, if I am wrong, I don't think it lasts the entire season. Like I, I right. put it this way. If I draft Brian Thomas as my wide receiver four, round eight, nine, ten, and he starts off first two weeks, three for 47, you know, two for 40, and it's 90% round participation, Gabe Davis is out there all the time. Unless Gabe Davis is going out there and putting up six for 101 two weeks in a row, I'm actually going to try and buy low. Like, I'm not concerned. If I have Brian Thomas and if I didn't get him, I would actually try to buy low. That's how unworried I am by this route participation. Yeah, yeah. Davis will be the biggest buy or sell high candidate in the first couple of weeks, and, and <laughs> Thomas will be the biggest buy low candidate, especially if it starts off that way. And I think that Trevor Lawrence is going to bounce back this year. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what his season looks like, and I have a lot of shares of him. Like, I just... I think Brian Thomas and Gabe Davis will actually help his game out. So I could, I could see Gabe being the guy, you know, you know, he's hundred percent on the field a lot end zone targets. We've that's what we've seen so far in very small sample size in preseason, but we've seen a couple shots. We know that Calvin Ridley led the NFL in end zone targets last year. So there's certainly a void to be filled, uh, but I'm, I'm just team Brian Thomas with you. I have him aggressively ranked in the mid to low forties. Uh, so I, I actually don't have an issue if you want to get him to, to get him in the eighth and instead of waiting, oh, maybe he's there in the ninth and the tenth, which has been the case. But mm -hmm. why not just get him? And, you know, the way that you construct your team, I think, as a wide receiver four is perfect. You don't have to put him in right away. I think there will be a little boomer bust in his game. But we already know that there, that's involved in Gabe Davis's game and he struggles with drop. So it just may be uh, taking time. Kirk is hurt to start. Ingram had a couple touchdowns over the weekend or at least one people will freak out about that. But like oh, the deep yeah. threat guy in the offense is Thomas and Gabe. And I just think we both agree. Like when they signed Gabe, we we're like, ah, okay, maybe three or four. And then they drafted Brian Thomas. And we're like, oh, like I'll throw that RIP the Davis. And <laughs> they just got a better version of Gabe Davis and Brian Thomas. But af after all, he is a rookie. Uh, but Thomas is going to take a couple, or T Law is going to take a couple shots at him deep down the field. I'm really excited about him. He's probably the the rookie that have the most shares of. Brian Thomas or yeah. Chris Godwin? I would take Thomas. I think Godwin's okay. safer, but like, mm. all right. Well, then do you want one. like seven to nine fantasy points a game, or do you want like some double digit week weekly winning performances? And I think that's what Thomas is going to give you. Well, then let me let me go one more. Uh, do you want a potential? 28 percent target share and i'm saying that guesstimating of what we've seen so far in deontay johnson or do you want brian thomas because as you think about that deontay johnson has been peppered uh yeah. as every yeah. report has been brian or bryce young and deontay johnson have ate breakfast lunch and dinner together they're watching movies hanging out feeding each other popcorn they love each other they they're spending all the time together Every time Bryce Young gets on the field, he just looks where Deontay is. Like, where's my buddy? Yeah. And tongue in cheek aside, uh, there's been talk of Adam Thielen has a little bit left. Jonathan Mingo's been running at the three because Leggett's been hurt, which has hurt Leggett for our excitement, anybody else's excitement. You know, I would still take Leggett over Mingo for the upside if I'm drafting one at all, but Leggett's basically fallen to undrafted at this point in fantasy because yeah. of that. Uh, Thielen's been a thing. Tommy Tremble's been a thing. Jatavian Sanders out there with 100% route participation is all of a sudden get his name floated around a little bit. But the real answer to circle all the way back is Deontay Johnson with the volume of all volumes or Brian Thomas. Because if we told you 100, if I said this, meaning both of them have 110 targets this year, I would take Brian oh. Thomas 10 times out of 10. It wouldn't even close. 
But this might be 100 targets for Thomas and 140 plus for Deontay. So which way are you leaning? Because I'm leaning a little bit Deontay and I was before this week leaning Brian Thomas. Yeah, I have Deontay at 36. I have Thomas at 40. Uh, So again, I have Thomas ranked pretty aggressively, but Deontay's in that range of like Kirk and Hopkins and Cortland Sutton. Like, am I excited about Cortland Sutton? I can view these guys the same way. Like, they're they're the ones. Um, yeah, Deontay is definitely going to get more volume than Brian Thomas Jr. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but okay. the ceiling is capped. Like, the dude's got five touchdowns in his last 35 games, and now he plays with Carolina and Bryce Young. So, uh, but well, the volume I was gonna is going to be Deontay there. Johnson or Zay Flowers. I would go with Zay Flowers. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. I was going to say, because I think you might be talking about a 30 target difference for Deontay. And I might, I think I lean Deontay Johnson. Over, like, if you told me, again, this is another if you told me, if you told me Mark Andrews gets hurt again, Zay Flowers, sure. But I just, I keep going back to the Ravens wide receivers. Just, it's Mark Andrews, then the wide receivers. And now Isaiah Likely is a factor, and there's other options. Like I just, I just feel I like slight- it's slightly different this year because just because Flowers is that's good. what we've been saying every year. But those other guys are just <laughs> not; they haven't been good. Like I'm a good Ravens wide receiver, can't do it. Mike I Wallace? don't remember the last one. Anquan Bolden. I really don't remember the last good. Mike Ravens Wallace is good. Receiver. Tory Who? Smith was good. Mike Wallace. Mike Tory Wallace, Smith. Sure, but what year was that? Those were like the. I don't know. <laughs> What's his face from the Steelers caught a touchdown last night? What the hell on a different team? What the hell is his name? Oh, the yeah. other, uh, the other Mike Wallace, Martavis Bryant caught Martavis a touchdown. Bryant. <laughs> Martavis Bryant got a bunch of buzz this morning from Dan Quinn says he sees him as like definitely on the roster. Like maybe he's wow. the guy. Wow. And Washington is a wide receiver too. Again, what year is it? Uh, but like I, I could say that Deontay Johnson finished top fifteen in targets and volume. So like. And like we can't ignore him in the mid to late 30s. Again, like his ceiling is cap. Carolina's awful. Bryce Young, all these things, but volume is king. And if you can get this guy as your wide receiver three, which you can, mm-hmm. it's like Thielen. It's just like Thielen from last year. Like this guy put up wide receiver two numbers for the first half of the season, I then flex, feeling. and then he, then he was quiet. I took him to guillotine league for a buck because I actually don't think he's he's going to go away like he may slow down again at halfway through the season but to start the year Carolina has to throw the football and those are the two guys that are going to get the targets I could see after week one we're sitting here and looking at target leaders and like we're, we're whoa both of these guys had 15 17 combined targets so yeah I think Deontay's interesting okay I don't know if I'm taking him over Zay Flowers so. Here's another interesting one. What are you doing about the 49ers backfield? Because it has been uh, Elijah Mitchell in the past, and we've seen Elijah Mitchell, and Elijah Mitchell fits the Shanahan offense. Part of the fit and appeal here is why I liked Isaac Grendo out of the draft, who got hurt, but by the way, returned this week. So just thinking long-term, super deep league, or remember the name. I just don't yeah. forget about Grendo. But Mitchell's been banged up, and Jordan Mason has looked good finally uh he's been picking up everything including running this offense picking up pass blocking doing a lot of things that check the box i have a feeling just from previous years and reports and shanahan is not 100 percent truthful but kind of when he says stuff about running backs you kind of just at least raise the eyebrow from past years he's spoken positively about mason are you moving mason over mitchell because i am i have mason ahead of mitchell yeah um I, I I think that I think if they were both healthy, it would be Mitchell. I have them pretty close, but I have been, you know, in some in some high stakes like outside of round twenty, I have been taking Mason more than Mitchell. Um, again, I think it's health. I think it's just like who's healthy right now and who is like mm-hmm. showing us things, and and that's Mason. So I think that he has a leg up right now on Elijah Mitchell. Uh, I could see when. The, I could see if it's like halfway through the season, they're both fully healthy. Like Elijah Mitchell was a guy who was like touching the football throughout the playoffs in the Super Bowl when they were spelling like CMC. It wasn't a whole lot, but he was he was the guy. And I think that Shanahan would tell you if they were both healthy that he would be the guy. But right now, it's not the case. So if you're looking for a CMC handcuff, I don't love the handcuff, but you're protecting your investment in, in the first round. Why not do it with CMC and, the, and Shanahan, the 49ers offense? So. I would go Mason first. And if you missed out on him, you know, in a deep league, I would I would take Mitchell later. Just have one of those guys. 
We'll just go to Flyer and, you know, yeah. if you want a piece of this. All right. So let's talk about another tight end to come back to things. And whew, I, I was, I'm sad about this one. This is, so no. 90% of the time when you're as invested as we are and you've been listening to us and you've been drafting, you know, there's a lot of values to be had. Like there's values we're going to be talking about right now. And today that if you wait till Labor Day weekend, it's like pff, gone out the window. Jalen McMillan. Could be one of them. Like yeah. you get them for free, and now you're like, "Ooh, well, maybe now I have to take them in the twelfth round." Doesn't sound like a huge difference. Point being, there's a lot of these. One that felt like a value, and one that I was like, "You always kept saying, I want a top nine tight end, top nine tight end." Ends with Jake Ferguson, and I think it could even be better than that. And the mm-hmm. one that I was saying, I could see if I miss in the top nine going after was not T.J. Hawkinson with the injury and all that type of stuff. It was Fryermuth. It's like because he could be the number two because Roman Wilson's hurt. Van Jefferson is the number two. By the way, Van Jefferson is the number two wide receiver for the Steelers. Talk about a team that needs a number two. Uh, oh you want to take a flyer Jefferson? I'm okay with that. I mean, I did Chris Harris's podcast, and it was undrafted players that you might have value with. And his one of his was Van Jefferson. He's like, and I hate the player. <laughs> so like, sorry, Van Jefferson. <laughs> Opportunity. But Arthur Smith is ruining Friar Muth just like he ruined Kyle Pitts. Uh, He is not running 100% of the routes. We have Darnell Washington in the mix. He's not getting a lot of targets. Fryermuth went from being a fringe tight end one to me to I just don't even want him anymore. Are you with me on this? (laughs) I I gave uh, our guy Fox uh, my tight end rankings over the weekend, and I had to make some adjustments, and Fryermuth was one. I moved him to 13, which is like doesn't seem like – but I had him in around him the enough. 10 or 11 range. Yeah, I know. I have him you in know the... where he is for me. <laughs> what do you got him 18. Like 17, 18. Wow. Behind Schultz, Hill, Taysom Hill, Luke Musgrave. I even considering moving a Conquo in front of him at this point. Yeah, I'm actually really worried about a Conquo um, because I feel like some reports out of Tennessee is that he's like could be the tight end two or three on that team. I know that there's another tight end. I'm considering. Yeah, there was a tight end that was, was out with a concussion and, and even a Conco didn't get any run, but I really like him overall as a player. I just like, <laughs> yeah, I have him. I have a Conco at like 28 and no offense. What's the upset? I had to go back and look at no offense numbers That's... last year. Seeing no fan inside the top 20. I'm just like, where does this guy? He averaged like four fantasy points per game last year and he basically played a I full season. I, I just don't know where he fits in to everything that they have going on there. But like, uh, I, I will say that Arthur Smith is super frustrating. Maybe he's just, I don't know, man. I try to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. Like maybe he just wants to see Washington. (laughs) I know. Maybe he just wants to see Washington because when they drafted him, he was hurt, right? And he wasn't really getting any run. Good tight end class. Just like wondered how, like I was confused with with the pick. I'm not in on Pat Framuth, but I could see a scenario where he is like, like you just said Van Jefferson, right? So like as the number two, can he catch four or five passes a game? It's not exciting. No, because you know what the answer is. The number two in this offense is. You know who the number two is on this team, right? Uh, who, oh, using it's the Warren word, or Najee. And... Oh, no, no. That's what I was going to say. It's not actually who. It's what is the number two. The entire yeah. damn backfield. And I'm yeah. bringing this up to say once again, everybody's like, oh, well, Jalen Warren's hurt. Najee Harris, move him up. No. Because Cornell Patterson stepped in and just did what Jalen Warren was doing. I told how many times yeah. did I say this yeah. this all season meeting? I said Cornell Patterson is the thorn in the yeah. side that nobody's paying attention to. And everybody's like, right. no, he was just for kick return and a little bit of the passing game. I'm like, no, it's going to be he brought him over. Arthur Smith is the worst human coach in the NFL <laughs> for fantasy. For fantasy. He's probably a great yeah. dude. Like, yeah. like, I don't know. It's debatable. Like, like, well, oh, what he ruins fantasy, he ruins he fantasy does. for everybody. And and they didn't just sign him, yeah, you're right, they didn't just sign him. It's like a decent contract, I think it was like nine million bucks, it's more than just like a punt two return, years, dude. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you got you guys have heard me say this before. I know you've heard he had more attempts at the goal line last year than B. John Robinson, who they took in the first round and early in the first round of draft. So, <laughs> I do agree with you on Cordero, and yeah, Pat Pat Frymuth is a guy that I've bumped. It's like all these guys, right? What what do you Meaning, like, Pat Frymuth? Where's the ceiling with Pat Frymuth? If if you invest a top ten pick in a running back, you have to keep him healthy, Meanie. Come on, yeah. 
Let's, yeah, let's be smart of, here. Yeah, for the long <laughs> run, knowing that. that he won't even be the coach on the team next year. You could have just <laughs> ran him into the ground. But like, yeah, Schultz and Komet, I like his players, but they're buried. Taysom Hill, we talked about, you know, always just finishing tight end 12, 13, fancy boots. Luke Musgrave, buried. Lots of guys going on. Just talking about Otten. Great. He's out there running reds, not getting the ball. Conklin, Hunter Henry, John O. Smith, Kaseki, Dulcich. Like, this, get yourself a top 10 tight end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm looking right now, and so I adjusted it, like, and I've got Fryermuth now for 11% of the target share. 11%. Like, where, where do you yeah, have, like, comes... what's the Washington, like, how, should we be more in on Sanat? I'm not, because, oh, Sanat? Oh, you meant yeah. Washington, I thought you meant Darnell Washington. No, no, I still... forget him. Should we be more in on the on the rookie tight end? Because... It's, a, it's a fair question, but my okay, my issue is again, how much does Zach Ertz just be a thorn in I his side just because of veteran lot presence? Early. I think that early, that's my concern. Like I'm thinking time. Sanat later in the season, best ball, obviously, but you know, best yeah. ball is thinking, you know, everybody's valuable. I say that all the time. Um, but that's you're stashing Sanat for the second half. Uh, because like right now I have Ertz for eight and a half target share and Sanat for nine point nine. If you told me I could project from week eight out. I think that would be more yeah. like yeah. six and change and potentially 12. Uh, like, like, you know what? Let's talk about that real quick because at this time last week, when we did this podcast, we talked about it on Sirius XM, but not on this podcast, John Dotson done. Um, John Dotson is bye-bye from the Washington Commanders. Uh, we poured one out for him on Sirius XM. But the big question is, who is the number two? And I've been taking a lot of flyers on Diami Brown. He is Clearly the number two on the depth chart, whether that equates to fantasy production will be remain to be seen. But the one that people are pushing ahead of him and the one that people are excited for seemingly, and maybe just because of his last name, is Luke McCaffrey. Uh, Luke McCaffrey, I think, is a very nice player, and I think he has potential. I think he's more of a slot option, like a Demiro Douglas, like a Julian Edelman, but not the great Julian Edelman, like the... Like, the Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, lesser versions, like the ones that are like, okay, Demario Douglas, I'm going to go back. Demario Douglas is that, mm, you know, mm. okay, 90 targets, going to catch 70 of them, but it's going to equate to 600 some odd yards and three touchdowns. And that's my concern. And that's why even if McCaffrey was the number two, I think there's still a higher ceiling with Diami Brown. Yeah, I I move both of these guys up clearly after the trade and our, our conversations, but I still couldn't get them like in the 60s. Like, I still couldn't get them ahead of Jalen Polk, Darnell Mooney, Wicks, Patrick. Oh, really? I could take Diami oh. over, not over Patrick, but I take him over, uh, over Jalen Polk at this point. Jalen Polk, yeah. I'm just, I have Diami. Here, I'll give you I'll give you my ranks. Cool. And so starting at Wicks at 61, uh, Wicks, Gabe Davis, Judy, who we're going to talk about, by the way, Demario Doug, Demario Douglas, Yoshivas, your boy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Diami Brown, Thielen, Demarcus Robinson, Wandell Robinson, and Tim Patrick. Like right in that range. If you want to take Tim Patrick, I'm not even going to fault it too much. It's just, I still, yeah. my, my like, biggest concern is him staying healthy for the entire year at yeah. this point. We're pretty much in the same range as a lot of these guys. Um, I got Polk in there just for like pure upside, and I don't believe in the in the Patriots wide receiver room. Uh, so I think he can have an opportunity. But yeah, I think that, I don't you know, and, Patriots. It, yeah. yeah <laughs> um you know if you have sleeper you got your notifications on you get a report from i forget who it was some guy from espn who covers washington and he was just giving his two cents and it's like you know mccaffrey's behind i don't know he's like considered wide receiver five or six or he's got some room to make up or he's nowhere close to the slot role or something like that which mm -hmm. really doesn't surprise me it shouldn't surprise you it shouldn't surprise anyone like it just it isn't automatically going to happen because of the trade this guy was a quarterback a couple years ago was he not like he's yep. converted to wide receiver. It's going to take time. I could see in the second half, it's just like sticking with these veterans. Zach Ertz, pain in the ass. Crowder, <laughs> going to be one as well. He really will be. Zach like, Ertz going to listen see... to this podcast and be like, why am I pain in the ass? And Ertz, you know I love you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> big catch in the Super Bowl. Um, no, but seriously, Crowder is a veteran too. Like, don't you think that at full health week one, the veterans are on the field and then like Thielen, they slow Jason down Crowder's Hurts, annoying. Crowder. These guys slow down. Then maybe a little bit of McCaffrey, but I think the biggest winner is Eckler. I, I the upside is with Diami Brown, right? Good call by you. I think the deep ball is great. Who's the deep ball guy? And it's probably him. 
Don't forget well, Alameda Zacchaeus. I mean, he's still, they, they, he has sat yeah. because, they, like I said, he is the slot option to start. And has yeah. actually been playing outside a little bit, which seems like uh, that's not going to work. But, <laughs> I mean, it happened with Wondell Robinson with the Giants, so. Yeah, if this offense is a lot, if, if the preseason is telling it all with this offense, it's going to be a little bit different than I thought. Like a lot of screens. And it's and also going to be Terry McLaurin and nobody else. Yeah, it's, and getting it out quick. It's been Deontay quick. Johnson with a great quarterback. Yeah, with a great quarterback. And, of course, we saw a design run from him, which resulted in a touchdown, I think, in his second preseason game, Jaden Daniels. So I think it's going to be a lot of short. I think it's a whole lot of Terry, which we've seen for since he's entered the NFL. Yeah, you want to get excited about Terry, by the way? Uh, real quick. Uh, Terry McLaurin, 139 <laughs> targets. I need to know touchdown. I just, it's always the no, same. No, no, no. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the whole thing. Uh, 139 targets for Terry McLaurin, 86 receptions, 1164 yards, and seven touchdowns. That's Checks him in. Too. Wide receiver 17. Oh baby, and he's still going in the early 30s, like high 20s. Yep. This is t- this has been one of the toughest years, I think, when your projections say something and then your rankings. Like, I just feel like there is a tier. I could name 15 wide receivers and Terry's in that <laughs> tier of guys like, cause there's a lot of, th- you know what the funny thing was a lot of teams is out there that have three t- tier four and five were initially the same tier for me. No, they were initially. Yeah. So tier four was initially all the way. So it went from 20 to 38. And then I was like, you this know what? what there, there, there is a little bit of a cutoff for me. Uh, like, and this is why I changed it. So like now it starts with Jalen Waddell at 20 and goes down to Michael Pittman at 30 because I'm like, I'm down on Michael Pittman, obviously at 30. I have zero Michael Pittmans. And that's even with Josh Downs being hurt, which funny enough, I was going to transition to that team next. But that being said, that Smith, that Smith, that Smith here, that tier has Devontae Smith, Terry McLaurin, Amari Cooper, Christian Kirk. Like those are the names in there. The next tier is still Calvin Ridley, Keenan Allen, Zay Flowers. And like, I I could argue they should be in yeah. there. And it goes all the I way know. down to Tank Dell at 38. But I do think there's a li- like a fringe of a cutoff there where it's like, okay, these are guys that are clearly twos or could be twos and fall down to threes or threes that become twos. Yeah. And that's why I have them there. Like Deontay Johnson's there. But like, I feel like you could put Deontay Johnson with Christian Kirk. But then I'm like, well, it's Trevor Lawrence versus Bryce Young. There's right. a little bit of a gap. But yeah. your point stands and that if you want to really nitpick i mean i don't if i told you wide receiver 22 to wide receiver 38 was less than two points per game difference maybe even one point half one one and a half actually yeah. let's look last year let's look and see the the difference in fantasy points per game as oh come on fantasy football today what is your freaking overlay ad that i can't even close thank you very much i like ff today by the way all right so if you go to where did i say wide receiver 22 Wide receiver 21 was 11.8. To get to 9.8, you have to drop down to wide receiver 39. That's how big that gap is. That's almost, that's 18 players. So yeah, I mean, it's, and I just think this year too with, I don't know, you're just adding, there's a few teams that have like three wide receivers, right? You're adding Ridley to the to the Titans room and then, you know, you're adding, um digs to the texans room so there's a there's a lot of like maybe low-end one b's like like Devonte and waddle and higgins well, i was gonna say squad, the difference between Devonte smith and garrett wilson was 1.7 points per game last yeah. year I, uh, it's wild man and like yeah higgins Deontay, even lockett all nine plus kirk 10 plus pickens flowers mind you yeah so i said so i, I think said it's, it's better two points um, yeah well no no, no, no. i was gonna say for us on uh, xm or on the next episode to like identify the guys we don't want in this lengthy tier that's that could be a good point <laughs> i like that i was gonna say there's a two-point gap from wide receiver again from wide receiver 21 to wide receiver 39 there's a two point per game gap the two point per game gap from wide receiver six only gets you to wide receiver 17 that's the difference yeah. yeah, I just I just let that sink in for a second while you're drafting this year. For everybody's like right. again, especially meanie style. But uh, what I was gonna go meanie style. You like how I named that meanie style? Yeah, I I am been moving up, and I tweeted this as a joke this morning. I was like, why draft Xavier Worthy in the seventh round? And I brought up McMillan's name, but the bigger one in there in that tweet, the main that you should really pay attention to, was Ad Mitchell. Why do that mm-hmm. when you can get Ad Mitchell six rounds later? 
A.D. Mitchell is going to be on a lot of my teams late. He was already sprinkled in. I didn't love his landing spot because I like Josh Downs. I like Josh Downs' fit with Anthony Richardson. Now, Josh Downs is coming back. Let's be clear. But the thing I liked about A.D. Mitchell so far this preseason is while Downs is out, Mitchell hasn't spent the entire time in the slot, but he's played there. He's played there in three wide, but when it goes down to two wide receivers, he kicks back outside, which makes me think, uh uh-oh, Josh Downs, and yay, A.D. Mitchell. Are you with me on this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't love the landing spot either, and then I heard Shane Steichen talk about, like, A.J. Brown, and I don't want to compare the two, but he did say that he is going to play the A.J. Brown role in the offense, which like does mm-hmm. excite me as a guy that they can move around. He can play a little bit in the slot. He can play outside. He's going to have a lot of one-on-one. He just will because when everybody's healthy, boxes will be stacked against Taylor and Anthony Richardson. And we know Pittman is a short intermediate type guy, RPOs, yada, yada. That's how the offense is going to roll. But, man, A.D. Yeah, Mitchell's yeah. going <laughs> to shot. 80 80 he's gonna get some shots down the field and i like the versatility so far that i've seen right it's like when when steichen talks him up and then downs gets hurt it's not just you know oh we'll keep you in your role we're gonna move you around here here's an opportunity playing the slot right he's been getting some reps playing there in scrimmages practice and during games so man i can't believe how cheap he is like he's in the like get range. He's in the guy. He's in the range where he's just not. Everybody's overdrafting Michael he's Pittman. Way behind McCall. 15. And we and, love McCall. Oh yeah, and we do. So yeah, I'm with. I you. moved. I have Eddie Mitchell at wide receiver 52 now, sandwiched between Keon Coleman and Xavier Worthy. I will take him over Xavier Worthy. Straight up, you yeah. don't have. Again, as a reminder, look at ADP. You don't have to. You could actually draft no. Xavier Worthy and Eddie Mitchell. But the problem is now be. Xavier Worthy still is being drafted. Not quite near his ceiling, obviously, but he's pushed up pretty, pretty close, high already. Man. And they signed Juju Smith Schuster, <laughs> which I think all that means is Kadarius Tony is gone. If Kadarius Tony gets cut, I know they only got like a season and a half from Darren Waller, but the Giants definitively won that trade, even if he doesn't get cut at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. The third round it's, pick it's, turned into Darren Waller, so and especially with all the hype, like go get him now, League Winner Dynasty. Oh my goodness, I you know what the counter argument is, right? Got a first round pick for Darius Tony. He caught a touchdown to win a Super Bowl. So, like, there's the counter argument they win a Super Bowl because of Darius Tony. (laughs) You know what? If it wasn't Darius Tony, it would have been some other Jabajagook. I don't even know what that is. I just made up a word. (laughs) This guy, (laughs) this man, you're setting me off. Uh, I talked Ertz in the first Super Bowl, but this guy didn't do anything all year and he was phenomenal in that Super Bowl punt returns and that, that catch. And then even last year in the Super Bowl, he actually made a couple of plays as well. I was like, this guy, only in the big stage, he can't do anything else. But I, I would imagine that he's cut. I think that Juju Smith-Schuster addition is not great for him or Watson. I think you just hang on to Watson. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I just was trying to figure I was trying to make sure that word wasn't actually a word. I actually just Googled it. I'm like, did I just did I make it like a slur that. that somebody knows, nobody knows about that I don't even know about? Anyway, if it is in anything, wasn't intentional. I think I just made up a word. But before we get out of here, two more concerns. We're actually flipping to negatives as we get out of here. Ah, maybe I'll come up with a positive note at the end. But anyway, Audric Estime. Concern that he's not even draftable now. Like the this has been interesting because you remember a month and a half ago, Javante Williams might be cut. Like Javante yeah. Williams might not be making this freaking team. And Audric Estime pounder between the tackles. I said the same thing. Not a lot in the passing game, but that was fine because that's going to be Jaleel McLaughlin anyway. But as we've approached the season, it's been Javante Williams is getting back to 100%. And Javante Williams is the best all-around talent. And Sean Payton's all of a sudden talking up Javante Williams. And Jaleel McLaughlin's still a thing. But Audric estimate in his opportunity in the final week, he was out there. And he was out there running first teams. But any third down opportunity, passing opportunity... His no butt was coming off the field. And Jaleel McLaughlin, not even the factor. It was, oh, the other one that I just actually spaced on Batty. Pure? It was Tyler Batty. Oh, Batty. So, yeah. yeah, that's Audrey Gastame. You even draft him at this point? I'm not. No, there's just too much going on there. Like, I want to draft Javante, and I do have a couple more shares lately because of Peyton, what you said. Peyton's talked him up. And at the same time, he's looked good. And I think that's why Peyton's talking him up. Last time, last year, uh, 
you know, it didn't seem like Peyton really liked him. He, there was all kinds of different packages near the red zone, McLaughlin, P Ryan, even P Ryan was getting, I, when I saw Javante get taken off for P Ryan for a goal line rushing attempt, I just knew that uh, Javante was in a bad spot. Um, this year seems a little bit more promising P Ryan final year. Maybe there's some sort of cut there. Maybe he's cut and that opens things up for, for estimate to, to have a, like a clearer path, quicker path, but He's not going to play ahead of these guys. And you just said it like it's kind of I don't want to call him a one trick pony, but he's not catching the balls in the backfield. You can get some goal line attempts. I could see him fall in the end zone a couple of times. Short yardage stuff. But Javante McLaughlin, it's just a crowded backfield on a team that's going to be playing from behind a lot. So he's not going to catch any passes. OK, I'm with you, obviously. And last one, Nick Chubb, as we mentioned before, the week fours. Is the least what he's out. We didn't really harp too much on Nick Chubb, so I want to finish out like your thoughts on that. Initially, Nick Chubb, uh, we have been talking about for weeks and saying RB twenties, uh, kind of in that lower twenty of, you know, Javante Williams at the time, and just being like, hey, hundred percent Nick Chubb is a league winner, and hundred percent Nick Chubb is an RB one, low end at worst. But now you have the four weeks and how far do you move him down, I guess, is the question. Meaning, like, do you take a Devin Singletary knowing Devin Singletary is capped out as an RB2, or do you take a Nick Chubb? Like, basically, where did you have him, and where did you move him to? Because I think you did the same thing I did. I moved him down a little bit. He was in the mid-RB20s. I would actually take him over the entire Steelers' backfield, as I said at the time. And depending on my roster construction, I still might, because you know how out I am on the Steelers' backfield. But, I mean, if Najee Harris is on the board, even thinking we said before... I'd still lean Najee Harris slightly over, but I'm probably just drafting wide receiver anyway at that point. Yeah, I we expected this news though, didn't we? We expected this news. People are going to bump him down. We'll bump him down. We'll talk about him being bumped down, but like he wasn't. No, I thought there was cutting. a world where he wasn't on the pup. They were going to leave the door open for a week three ish okay. return, and then slowly brought along till like. My whole thought of him at RB, I think I had him at like 24, 25. I pushed him yeah. down to like 30, not that far. But my yeah. thought was that, oh, that's if he avoids the pup, because then you leave that window open to the Saquon Barkley situation. This clearly out for four and then potentially another two weeks. I think you have to bump him down. At least if you were with me on that, you have to bump him down a little bit. Yeah, I had him in the uh, low 30s. Uh, again, I adjusted some ranks Um towards the end of last week and I did bump him down into the low thirties. I think I had him like 27. Um, and I do have a lot of shares of him, but I've been taking him as like my fourth running back, sometimes my fifth. And it was outside of, of round 10. Uh, I'm willing to still take a couple shares in him that way, but the way that I construct my teams, like if I'm, if I am heavy wide receiver, I just don't think it makes a lot of sense for him to be your third running back. I mean, injuries are going to happen, you know, and you're going to have to make some, some drops or you, maybe you're thin at running back. You just don't want to be thin at running back and having him on your squad. So I think if you started off the draft with like RBRB, RB, um, you, then you pan some wide receivers and maybe you get back into another running back and he's your fourth. I think it's okay. But this is, uh, he hasn't, he hasn't been running and taking any cuts. Like, yeah, he squatted yeah. 500, 600 pounds, but I think that he's, I think it's going to be longer than four weeks. So six, at the end of the day, it's going to be half the season will be gone before we see you know, probably full tilt Nick Chubb at best. Okay. Because even if he misses six weeks, what? He comes back week seven, week eight. He's not going to Nick be Chubb or Jalen Warren. And he's not 100% either. Uh, I'll go. <laughs> I'll, I'll go Nick Chubb. I actually Nick believe Nick Chubb Najee. or either Cowboys running back. I'll go Nick Chubb over the Cowboys backs. Nick Chubb or Chuba Hubbard. I'll take Chubb because Chubb is going to play the first few weeks. And All right, then Chubb. Nick Chubb or Jerome Ford, his teammate? <laughs> I'll, I'll go Chubb, but I, I think it's an okay strategy to have both if you want. If you want to okay. go that way, you really want Nick Chubb. If you really want Nick Chubb, I would be drafting Chuba Hubbard. Nick Chubb or, or Gus Edwards. Ford. Um, yeah. I'm going to go with <laughs> Gus Edwards. Uh, J.K. Dobbins? <laughs> I'll take Chubb. Okay. All right, yeah. So basically, we're so right on the so same obviously really high. Can we get this? Well, no, guy, like, not that high. Nick Chubb fell on? to 35 for me. So, yeah. He went from, where did I have him? I had him right behind. Get him Tony in. So I had him 29. He fell him. six spots. 
you still can't get them outside of round 10. And, you know, if yeah. you're comfortable with, if you're comfortable with the way that you draft and all of a sudden you're like, oh man, I'm good to go. Speaking I'm running back. I'll take a shot on this guy. He's like, put him in my flex. Come week 11, 12, 13, this guy's in your flex. Top 24 running back, at least. So I think I mixed Jabroni and Gabagool together, according to Google. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm going. But I don't even remember thing, what you said. I just know I never heard of it. I before. said Jabagagook. Oh. I don't even know what Jabagagook is. I really don't. <laughs> I think it's just Jabroni and Gabagool. Uh, from the Sopranos, by the way. Er, before we get out of here, quick draft strategy thing. We talked a lot about it on the last podcast, so make sure you check that out if you haven't. A uh, reminder to do all the things to enter into the FTN slash Madden giveaway. And uh, oh, yeah. Also, if you play Survivor, um, the biggest pro football contests are back in Vegas. Circa Survivor mm-hmm. and Circa Millions are now up to record 16 million in guaranteed prizes. Two A's to win, no rake. Circa Survivor contests to select one team each week with no point spread. You know, Survivor. And the longest to win it all is 10 million guaranteed is on the table. So Circa Millions make five picks against the spread each week. Share of 6 million guaranteed through quarterly and full season payouts. If you like that better, enter Nevada. Play from anywhere. Visit CircaSports.com for details and meaning. Draft strategy as we get out of here. The one thing I did want to ask you. I saw this happen a few times over the weekend. Somebody was asking about keepers and then drafting and doing this. And that's something that I will never do. But I want to ask if you would, considering who is there, obviously, if it's one of the big three, four quarterbacks, if it's one of the big two or three tight ends, I will never take a tight end and a quarterback in the first five rounds. I say an argument for one or the other. Sure. But I will never do both because of what it does to the rest of your team. Would you ever do both? Because there's the argument that you can say, conversely, I have one of the best tight ends. I have one of the best quarterbacks, both. So I have a leg up at two positions instead of just one. Yeah, but then you're... I think if I did something like that, my running back room would really suffer because <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be able to ignore um, wide, wide receiver. receiver. And you're trying to you would have to ignore something. Balance. You'd have to ignore something. Uh, and I just I wouldn't want Deontay as my one. You know what I mean? Or like Brian Thomas Jr. as my two or something like that. So, uh, no, I wouldn't. I, I'm more willing, actually, to go elite tight end in the first few rounds as opposed to the running back or the quarterback. I don't have you a lot of shares at the, the top tier. Yeah. And I don't actually mind taking Ingram. And, you know, if the tight end room is, if your draft room is really aggressive on tight ends, I, I don't mind saying, okay, fine. You guys get your tight ends. Uh, and then I can get maybe an Ingram or uh, a Ferguson, you know, and, and maybe in the middle rounds after round six. But no, I wouldn't I do a both. Lot of George Kittle this year. Yeah. George Kittle's another one, right? Just super efficient. And he's going to be efficient again. And and who knows with Ayuk, right? Like, at least Jamar Chase returned to practice over the weekend. Um, Brett and Ayuk, man, I, I start to get concerned watch. about, like, soft tissue, hamstring pulls. Like, he, everything that I've heard is that he's just hanging out on the sidelines. Like, you hope that he's at home at least running on a treadmill or something. Because <laughs> if, if he pulls a hammy week one or week two and he's out four to six weeks, you're going to love George Kittle on your squad. Yeah, and I still think he plays with the 49ers, but we have a few more days to find that out as we wait. We're running out of time. Him. I know. Two week ramp up time. time for these guys. Two weeks to ramp it up. You know what I mean? Ayuk or Olave as of today if you're drafting? Olave. I bumped Ooh. Ayuk down too, to like 18 or 19. Just I think Ayuk he's going to play. I don't think he's going to get traded. DJ Moore. Ayuk or Devontae Smith? I have Ayuk ahead of Devontae, but it's in that same tier for me now with with Higgins and Waddle. DK Devontae. Metcalf? And DK's in that tier too. And I have DK ahead of. I have one spot ahead of Ayuk. Okay. Man, yeah. we both like Ayuk. I consider him a low end wide receiver one. Or at I least a high two. But we're it's August twenty sixth now. And I think he's <laughs> I was gonna say something negative. I I think he's I don't think his head space is right. I don't think he's in the right, the right, <laughs> right frame of mind. Right okay. I don't think he's in the All right frame of mind. He's gonna well, hopefully, up. people's headspace after listening to this are in the right frame of mind and they're ready to draft. And if not, we will be back on Sirius XM and another podcast later this week. And we'll have you ready at Chris Meany at All In Kid. Make sure you enter the contest to potentially win some FTN memberships or do the giveaway live on the show. And we will see you then as Meany now has to do the job of deciding when to cut off when I'm continuing to talk as I have a podcast coming out with Pat May.